Hi, y'all. We're excited to have you here. We want to welcome you to Flatiron Schools Intro to Data Science Effective Communication Using Python. My name's Corey Mickelson, and I'm the event coordinator here at Flatiron School. A part of my job is hosting these free introductory workshops like tonight's event to give y'all the opportunity to meet some of our fabulous instructors and get a better feel of the Flatiron School experience. So a quick little reminder that chat box is going to be our main source of communication. So make sure the little blue button is set from host and panels to everybody so we can all chat together. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host for the evening, Joe Como. He is one of our lead data science instructors. Go ahead and take it away, Joe. Woohoo! Thank you. So we're going to look at data visualization today. Um, tonight's meant to be a little educational, a little fun. And at the end, we're going to have a small activity to see who lives and dies on the Titanic, one of my favorite things to do. Um, you see my visualization, you guys have all been staring at, and um, a lot of times data scientists can find doing visualization stressful. Uh, so part of this lesson we teach is um, how to make it less stressful. So my all time favorite graphic, okay, the only time you should use the pie chart, when it is this clear, the pie I have eaten, the pie I have not eaten. Okay, otherwise we do not use pie charts in visualization. So our objective, have fun. Okay, uh, that's what we're gonna try to do and get a little learning in also. <clears throat> so why visualize data? So these are just some Python libraries we're gonna be using. Okay, some we will, some we may not. And we're going to load a somewhat famous data set of irises. And this is used in machine learning, okay? And this is a picture of an iris. And it turns out that irises are classified depending on their sepal width and length and their petal width and length, okay? So when we read this data in and we take a look at it, this is what we get from uh, our data set. So we read in a data file and this is what's in it. So as a person, um, trying to understand the data, especially as a data scientist, would this be more useful or would it be more useful if we plot it up? And this is the code we're going to use to plot it. And this is the plot we get. So which one's more useful? Okay. And it turns out you can uh, categorize these irises depending on their sepal width and length. And by just looking at this image, you can see there is one distinct species and then there are two that are a little less distinct and we can use machine learning to uh, try to separate these so you know as a graphic this is much easier to understand than trying to describe it with just this table over here right so it would take forever to look at this table analyze it and it so graphics can be much easier the reason they are much uh, better than just a table is that in general, not everybody, but in general, people are highly visual and they can synthesize visual information much more quickly than having to read through a table. And then it, uh, we are uh, precognitive understanding of the data is based on that idea that we learn, most people learn uh, really well visual. And there's that old saying, uh, one picture is worth a thousand words, and if you're like me and prefer to see things as opposed to read them, it's worth a million words, okay? So there are basically two types of visualization, and we're only going to talk about this first one. If you're a data scientist, you do do the second one a lot, but those aren't nearly as important as the first one, because in the first one, we're trying to explain uh, complicated ideas using a visual. So it's much more important you pay attention to how you do that. So in an explanatory visualization, um, there's a couple of ideas. Your graph should be clear and to the point it is trying to make. You don't want it overly cluttered. You don't want too much information on it. Know your audience. Okay, know if you're given a technical presentation or a non-technical presentation um, and how, um, how familiar they're going to be with the terms you might use. And I, I have a link on this uh, to go. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but there is a link that gives a lot of information on choosing the correct graphic for the relationship you're trying to communicate. 
what we saw earlier was the perfect graphic for that, uh, for seeing the different sepal and uh, petal length and width for those flowers. So knowing the correct graphic, and then always, if you're gonna have an explanatory graph, always label it well, so that everybody knows um, exactly what they're looking at. Um, some rundowns are that, uh, you know, people have an unconscious response to visuals and the effects they will have when they interpret their information. So a good visualization can uh, really uh, display your message really well if not you having to say much. The rule I like to use is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Because the simpler the graphic, the uh, easier it is to understand the message. The more complicated, the harder it is to understand. So enough yapping. Let's look at some pictures, OK? There's length and size. So like in this, it is having a graphic that is big enough to display the bars you want to show and also have a uh, height big enough to so that you can easily distinguish the different aspects of it. Uh, size can also mean the size of the dots. So be sure to choose sizes, where like in this case, that are fairly distinctive uh, so that you can easily distinguish the different sizes. For color, you always want to choose uh, co colors that contrast well. You don't want to use a, a lot of shades of the same color because then they become too hard to see and too hard to distinguish. So this is a, a pretty good plot in terms of picking colors. Doesn't hurt to add shape. So not only in this case have we added color, we now added shape, which can be a little easier to distinguish than size. Uh, in many cases. So like in this case, we have used both uh, um, color and different shapes to show different things. Now, this is, you know, how sometimes uh, people like to view themselves basking in their own awesomeness. Um, so hopefully if you're in my class, you will think that uh, the class is awesome and you're learning a lot and having a good time. I love that guy. He looks pretty buffed out. Uh, for a kangaroo, he seems pretty cool. You also want to choose a good angle for your titles and things, because if you don't have good angles, then your graphs could be hard to read. Uh, this certainly breaks one of the rules of data science visualizations in which we never use pie charts, because um, they are hard to visualize and it's hard to compare the area of, say, this blue to this red. But notice in this chart that uh, they have used good angles for all of their labels. Uh, and there's another one of angles where this one's kind of cool, so hard to see. This is a cool looking visualization, but this is just not a great visualization because it's too hard to compare the different colors and too hard and too busy to understand what's going on. So there are better ways to display something like that. This is another one where uh, this one might be a little hard to see. Let's see, is that the right one? Yeah. There we go. So, so you can see what yes. are necessary visuals for pie charts. I'm sorry. Necessary visuals for pie charts. So what um, would you consider to be? We we don't use them in data science. Uh, I'm not sure where they use them much. Um, and I'll show you a pie chart that is not informative. Uh, there are, if you're going to use a pie chart, generally we would just use a bar chart instead um, because you can see all the same information, but it's much easier to compare the length of the bars. So uh, it's just kind of a rule we go by. So, and this is kind of an example of, of one here where this is amazing looking and it has amazing colors and it has amazing angles. It's too hard to compare the 81% to say like the uh, 61% or the 60%. If you do this in a bar chart, it's much easier to see the relative sizes so that it uh, displays its message much better. So how you can lie with graphics, okay? They can be misleading and it is uh, generally really frowned upon in data science to pick graphics that may display a message that is not as truthful as you would like it to be. And this is actually one taken from, uh, this is actually from a news source, uh, a, TV, a TV news channel. 
um, where you can obviously see that the pie chart does not add up to 100%. So this is a case where you can create a visual that may show something you want, but it's not truthful. Um, so you just have to be careful. And I think this clicks to that pie chart. Okay, so let's take a look at some bad plots. Here's one where, and I don't even know if you can distinguish, it's hard to distinguish the colors. So they haven't chosen a good contrasting color so that you can see the two good sides of your bar chart. So while the information may be all correct, it's too hard to tell the difference between the colors. This one, I love this chart. I mean, it looks amazing, but it's too hard to uh, read like, what is this What is this blue box back here? I mean, I can't even tell what it is. I love 3D charts. I think these things look amazing, but it's too hard to uh, compare all of these different bar charts and bars to uh, like the ones in the front to the ones in the back. I can't even tell what this blue one goes with, which one of these it goes with. The titles are kind of small. Uh, even if I were to make it bigger, uh, you probably could read these, but it'd be too hard. There are better ways you can do this. Okay. Uh, okay, here's our bar chart. And not only does the bar chart, but there's so much information on here. It, it's just too hard to read all of these different little pie uh, slices in here. And who wants a piece of pie that small anyway? I'll take the blue piece personally. So here's a good link for, somebody was asking us earlier, if you follow this link, we'll just take a quick look of, of how to choose visualizations and what type of visualization does well with displaying what type of data. So um, we can, we will provide a link or this file, uh, my Jupyter notebook later, if you want to uh, have that link, uh, you will find it in here. So that is a great source of information, okay? Um, there also uh, this link here that shows another way to show all kinds of different charts. I'm trying to do this one right here. I'm trying to recreate this one for something, uh, which would be cool. So just a bunch of different types of charts for ideas uh, of one. And between this one and the link earlier, you can come up with some really cool present, uh, uh, visualizations. Uh, so what we try to do is make sure that our students uh, do have an idea of what they're doing. Uh, I know everybody, myself included at times, definitely feels like this puppy, but that's the cutest puppy in the world. That dog is so darn cute. I love that puppy. So, hey, let's play a game. Good or bad visualization. I'm going to show you a visualization. You're going to give us a thumbs up if you think it's good. A thumbs down if you think, uh-oh. Let's start with this one. What do we think? Now, good or bad? I mean, I love this. It is cool looking. It's amazing looking. Um, couple of things. I have no idea what this shows me. Um, I, I don't know what the title means. And, uh, uh, and it's too hard to read what all of the uh, values are. But it looks amazing, right? And it is done as an animation. So this is one where it looks good, but it's bad information. So it looks like most people said downer. Awesome, awesome. Now, how about this one? What do we think, good or bad? Okay. And I'll tell you this one now. This one's not even good as an explanatory. I'm sorry, as a... As a uh, you know, to uh, just explore your data. That's not even good for exploratory because you really can't see anything. What do we think with this one? Up or down? We're getting a lot of thumbs down, getting a lot of thumbs down. Uh, and I agree, as an explanatory, this is poor. As exploratory, this is okay. I mean, this is a cool looking plot. I love the colors. Um, as explanatory, it is too busy. Uh, it shows too much information. And, you know, generally when you show a graphic or a visualization like that, you have about 30 seconds to make your point and people lose interest. So it's gonna take you well more than 30 seconds to explain this thing well. As exploratory, this is probably really cool because uh, if you're just exploring it and this is just for you, this is a pretty cool plot. You could probably get some interesting information off of here. 
that would lead maybe to some of your next steps, either in uh, either in data analysis or maybe some data modeling. So this is good for exploratory, bad for explanatory. What about this one? Any idea? Heat maps are cool, um, but that one was a little confusing. Heat maps are extremely, can do some uh, really good stuff with heat maps. I definitely love heat maps, uh, just not that particular version of it. So as we know, this is a cool one. Bar charts are one of the best visualizations um, to display because, you know, one, two, what do we have over a dozen pieces of information on here uh, we can display and we can easily compare. Anybody have an idea what you might do to improve this just a little bit? This is a cool one. But I would do one thing to this particular visualization that would help it. Uh, does anybody have an idea? Order it. Very good, Javier. I would order it. I would probably order this from left to right, uh, 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 depending on what your point is. You know, most people read left to right. So if my point is the maxes are important, I would uh, order this left to right with the max values on the left. If the mins are the most important, I would order it left to right with the mins on the left. But absolutely ordering it. But uh, this is not bad like it is, you know, but it's just too bad if you want to say, or it's a little harder if you want to say Dodge and Toyota are the important things here. Uh, it's too hard to compare. Them. So um, ordering it would be cool. It would be very cool. How about this one? This is a box plot. Uh, it shows a ton of information. Um, it shows the, uh, the distribution. It shows the quartiles. And it actually also shows some outliers. What do we think? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways, thumb up my nose. Anybody have an idea? Everybody saying thumbs up. And this one's a, this one's a, a sideways. If you're giving a, uh, somebody says too small, I agree. And that is mostly a function of uh, how I'm showing it in my notebook. Cause I'm actually showing this in a coding tool that allows me to code as we go. And we'll see, you saw it a little bit early and we'll see some more. Okay, so this is a thumb sideways. If you're giving a technical talk, this is awesome for a technical talk, okay? And, and either an explanatory or especially exploratory. For a non-technical talk, this is a thumbs down. It's too technical and too complicated for non-technical people who don't have experience in uh, working with these. Um, but I love box plots. There's so much good information in here. Um, just by looking at this, um, you can display a ton of really good information with these. What do we have next? Uh, let's shrink this one down just a smidge. And this is actually from one of our instructors uh, uh, created this. What do we think? Thumbs up, thumbs down, and I'll tell you what this comes from. This is a word cloud of descriptions of Scotch whiskey. So now once everybody hears about Scotch whiskey, it's a two thumbs up, right? And this actually is not a bad one either as an explanatory or an exploratory because what this comes from is a data science uh, project where they were using descriptions of uh, Scotch whiskey to try and predict what kind of whiskey you would like. Uh, and this uh, displays a, a pretty good amount of information in terms of what were the most common words used in uh, the description. And this is part of a natural language processing uh, project one of our instructors worked on. So uh, this is pretty good. This is pretty cool um, presentation and, and can be good for exploratory and explanatory um, because just in this one graph, you can kind of see what the most important and the most common words were. Okay, in, in the uh, data set he had. Okay, so uh, everybody loves memes, and um, you know, we're making visualizations about visualizations. That's what the other one kind of was. So uh, I love this meme. I love this next meme too. Let me blow this one up just a little bit. So this one has a question that goes with it though. So, uh, well, let me say here. I could fix my screen. That's what happens when you hit one key too many. 
on the Windows box. Let's see, what did I do? That one, kill that one. Oh, that's what I got into magnifier. Anybody know how I get out of magnifier? And now there is a way to get out of it. Somebody said escape. <laughs> I know. I've been hitting escape about eight times. Um, when you hit one, see too many. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. I have a fear. No control. Uh, to control the yeah, that's what I was trying. <laughs> I thought I was trying to hit and I got into this problem. Escape key, I like that. Yeah, I got in the magnifier somehow. Now my screen's all the fluey. Now it's not showing me anything. Jonathan, look up. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. The control zero control. There you go. You found it. Now we're back. Yeah, sorry about that. Now we're smoking. We got it. That's when you hit one key too many. Look at everybody trying to help. Thank you all. I know. I know. I love it. That's one thing you find about data scientists. We all like to be helpful. Okay. I'm back. Okay. Can I get back? Now can I get back to where I was? I lost my mouse. Here it is. Okay. Kill magnifier. And let's share my screen again. Let's see, I want this one. Are you seeing my screen now? Oh. Uh, oh, my Zoom quit. Your Zoom quit? I still see you. My Zoom quit. Can you still see it? Okay. I can see you, but it just says that you started sharing your screen, but I don't see your screen. It says double click to okay. enter screen mode. Mm -hmm. yeah, no way. Okay, is that better? Are you still now, there? Now I see you. <laughs> oh, I'm handsome. <laughs> Let's see. I need now. This thing has changed around on me. Okay, now can you see me? Yeah. All right, sorry about that. You hit one button in Windows, everything goes for fluey. Okay, so here is my question. Which one of these problems is the worst? Okay, can you see the my code doesn't work and I have no idea why, or my code works and I have no idea why? Which one uh, keeps me up at night? Does anybody know? Okay, uh, and, and somebody said my code works and I have no idea why, absolutely. And I'll tell you why, because when your code works and you don't know why, and then your boss comes in and says, give me the code, and then it breaks, you have no idea how it worked. You have no idea how it broke. If it's not working and you don't have any idea why, your boss will give you time to figure it out. I hate this bottom one. I've been there quite a few times. Uh, uh, it's a scary situation. And um, I try to avoid it, but it does happen. Now, after the game, you guys want to know what prize I get. And this is what I look like. And students ask me, what do they get for winning the game? They get a kitty that looks just like this. Because that is a cute kitty, but he don't look happy, does he? So, we're going to do a, you know, we've looked at a lot of visualization. And we're going to play a game. Who lives and who dies on the Titanic? This is an actual data set from the Titanic, okay? So I'm assuming everybody knows what boat this is, okay? It is not the Queen Elizabeth. It is not the love boat. It's not the SS Benno either. It is the Titanic, okay? And these are some of the libraries we're going to import in Python, okay, to do a uh, funnel exercise. 
So I just loaded all my libraries and I have this data and this data is available and we can zip this directory. I have all my stuff in and um, share this data with you and this program. Uh, we're going to look at some data set, okay? And what this data has is for the Titanic, and it's only about 890 people who are on the Titanic, but it tells you if they lived or died, okay? It tells you their sex or gender, their age, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, for, like I said, about a thousand people on the Titanic. And one of the, uh, one of the things we do is uh, at Flatiron is we can use this data set to see if we can create a model that will predict who lived and who died on the Titanic based on this data. Now, when you're a data scientist and you're working with data, when you read in data, okay, and you haven't worked with it before, you want to take every opportunity to try to familiarize yourself with your data. And one thing, if you're looking at this data is, you notice that sex is male and female, but over here they have who, it says man and woman. So basically they're showing the same amount of information. And if you're gonna try to model who lived and died, you don't wanna use the same information twice because it'll overweight that. And it could make your model better when it's not, it could make your model worse when it's actually better. So as a data scientist, you're always looking at your data discovering these things. Now, if you go back here, if you were to look at this data, you'll notice that age, uh, most of the time, is a whole number, like 22 or 23. But if you look at the data a little closer, uh, when it gets one or younger, it actually breaks it into fractions. Their youngest person on the boat is actually 0.4 years old. Okay? So, and also because um, there are only 800 people on here, if we were to look at the data by age and not and only use the whole year, we wouldn't get a lot of data in each year. So what I wanted to do was uh, I bend the data by five years. So I add all the data in five year chunks together so that I get a better idea of what's in uh, a better representation of what's in the data. And this is showing you the bins I use. So zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, and then the bottom number is inclusive. So um, this makes the data uh, a little more robust, okay? Uh, and now I can look at it and I can see if I go all the way over here to the end, it now has an age pin uh, based on the age so that uh, it'll give me a little more data per bin, okay? So what I can actually do now is I can, group the data, okay, and I can compute statistics based on the group of age, bin, survive, and sex. So that when I do that, I can create some cool uh, graphics off of. So once I've done that, I can compute what percentage of each age bin has lived and what percentage of each age group has died, okay? So, and that's what this does, it computes the percentage by age range and by sex, so by age bin and by sex, what percentage of them died? So that uh, once I run this, and you notice inside the presentation, I just ran this, it's just as simple as doing a shift and an enter, uh, it runs everything in the particular cell inside the presentation, so uh, we can see, we will teach you this, or some of us use this a lot at uh, Flatiron. Uh, and then what this does, it just plots it up, but this is what it creates, this cool graphic. Okay. Uh, and let me shrink this just a little bit so you can see what we have. So remember I told you I bend it by age group, and then I computed who lived by gender, and by, uh, by gender and by age group. And then I computed the percentage because there are more males on the boat than females. So that if I just uh, showed counts, it wouldn't really give me a fair comparison. If I change the number of percentage, 
I can now step through and see how this changes as I go through just by changing my slider. So I have created an interactive uh, bar chart, okay? Uh, using something, and what's cool about this is if we go back real quick, these are all of the lines. It only took these six lines to compute that interactive bar chart, okay? Um, I did all of the data work earlier. We saw that earlier, and that's what this is based on. So this is just picking all the people who survived, which is a one in the survive column, okay? If I want to change this and be a little more roast, and here's the thing about visualization, you can choose what message you're going to send. So if my, my message is all the people who lived on the boat, I put this as a one. If my message is, can we see all the people who died on the boat? Okay, then I would pick uh, I would pick uh, zero, and you can see the difference now is that now the red chart is uh, a lot higher in most cases because we're looking at the people who died. So more of a, as a percentage more males die than females, and I'm assuming everybody knows why. But can you guys put in the in the chat? Why did more males die than females? And while you're doing that, I'm gonna go. So this is cool, right? This is really cool. We can step through and do this, but maybe you want this to show as a visualization, okay? That you don't have to control manually, that you can run as uh, a movie. And now this is running as a movie. And in this case, we're showing what percentage of people die. Okay, so, uh, and you, this runs kind of fast. You have some control over this. I didn't put a lot of control into the frame rate and anything. So we've made not only an interactive, but we can also make it uh, uh, an animation. And it is also still an interactive bar chart. So now we've got two for the price of one. We've got an animation and a bar chart. And this particular time we focused on what percentage died. So by looking at that, you know, it gives us an idea that we might be able to predict just using gender, but uh, my, my, our sex is what they call it in this particular data set. This data set is really old. Uh, what I've done is set up a data science uh, machine learning model to try to predict who lived and who died. And that's what this does. So it is running it, okay? And uh, it is simply this, this easy. This is all the code that it takes to create a model that predicts who lived and who died on the Titanic. Uh, and then once it runs, we can look at the output. This is, so the way these models work are you take a certain percentage of your data and you train the model, and see how well it does. So in this particular case, I took about 80% of the data, okay, and trained it. And when training, it guessed with an accuracy of 91%. So 91% of the time was able to guess accurately if somebody lived or died. And one thing I kind of stepped over a little quick, what I am using for that um, is quite simply just the age, the sex, and the class because it is also based a little bit on the class, though I don't show that in here for our time reasons. Uh, as a project, we would go much deeper into this. Um, but with this little purple and gold, uh, I would call this a Mardi Gras box, because these are the colors of Mardi Gras. These are the natural colors. What this box shows me is when it was training, the bottom is what the model predicted. And on the left here is what the model actually uh, observed. Let's see if I can blow this up just a little bit without hitting the wrong button again. What I'm going to do is come out of the presentation so that we can see this a little better. Okay, so what this is showing is the model predicted correctly 293 people died. So it predicted they died and they actually did die. The model also predicts that 194 people lived and they actually did live. However, the model also predicts 24 people died who actually lived, and 24 people 
it predicts live to actually die. So um, these two boxes can be extremely important in things like medicine, or in this case, if this was actually choosing who lived and died on the Titanic, which of these boxes would you rather be in? Would you rather when the model predicted you died, but you actually live? Would you rather a model predict you lived, but you actually died? In this particular case, I wanted to predict I died, but I actually lived. But if you think about this idea, uh, this is used a lot in medical data. Uh, like we can take all kinds of data on people and predict whether or not they will get cancer. You want to be, uh, you want to be, uh, first of all, you want to be in this box here, predicting you don't have cancer and you don't. You don't want to be in this box where the model predicts you did have cancer and you did. But if you're going to, uh, if you're going to focus your model on which one of these it does well out of these two boxes, you want to get um, this one right. You want to predict they have cancer and they don't. So you want to be in this box. You want this box to be more than this box. Because if you predict they do have cancer and they don't, the worst thing you've done is you've treated them and they're okay. If you're in this box and you predict they don't have cancer and they do and you don't treat them, that could lead to their death. Now, the, the whole idea is not that we train a model. So remember, this is actually training on the data okay, that we make some predictions. Okay, uh, and if we run our model now, after we've trained it, and we show the same box for the predictions, we can see we don't do as well. In this particular case, we're only predicting 77% correct, instead of the 91% when we trained our model. So this gives you an idea of um, the same box. There are 86 people that correctly predicted died. 51 people had correctly predicted live, and then about the same number of, uh, or, or a lot more than was in uh, these boxes relative, but the same amount in each box means it's doing the same, it's doing about the same in predicting people died when they lived and predicting people lived when they died. So that is the end of the presentation, unless we have plenty of good questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. So oh, I know you all have some questions. What are we, how, are, how are we doing on time? 47 minutes. Woo! So, and that question of why, you know, uh, there were more males on the boat. But remember, we looked at percentages. So it's women and children first into the lifeboats. Uh, so that's why a higher percentage of women live. And there also, there's lots of fascinating things if you look at that data. One is, uh, if you look at um, younger than 18, zero to 18, there are more males than females. And part of the reason are uh, for single males than females because in 1905, Females uh, at 18 were not allowed to travel alone on a boat without a male partner or their parents. Um, and the moral of the story is you have to understand your data when you're going to start working with it and all of the aspects and ins and outs of it. Yes, we can share the code. This is all publicly usable code and data and images and nothing on here is proprietary. So. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the best way to do that. This is a Jupyter, it's called the Jupyter Notebook. It's not a text file. Um, you have to open it, the Jupyter Notebook, but it allows us to... Well, you're still on mute, Jeff. It allows us to, uh, sorry about the time. Uh, right off to run crazy about something. But yeah, uh, this particular... Sorry, I think somebody rang my doorbell. And now my three five pound dogs are going to kill them at the door. So, <laughs> <laughs> at least they think they are. Uh, so, this is what's called the Jupyter Notebook. It's available in Anaconda. Uh, that they, I think some people may have access to it. So, if they're. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we can absolutely share it. Um, and if somebody really wants it, we can try to. Uh, I can save it as a, as a Python text file. Um, as I think about it. So that's possible too, if you guys just let us know. Somebody was asking how to read the squares. Is that right? 
Yeah. Okay. So the way you read the squares is, and I know I went over that kind of quick, is okay, so the bottom, okay, the x-axis, zero means that it predicted they the model predicted they die. And the one means that it predicted they live. On the left are what the actual values are. So zero means that they actually live. And the one means that they actually die. So as you read this is a, a predicted value of zero and an actual value of zero means this box represents that they, uh, there are 293 people that actually live and the model, I'm sorry, they actually died and the model predicted they died. So the model accurately predicted 293 people died. So the, the two correct boxes where the model was correct was the top left and the bottom right. One means there were 194 people that the model predicted live and that they actually did live. So there are 293 people who died and the model correctly predicted they died. The 194 people who uh, live in the model actually predicted they live. So that's why these two are colored different. The purple boxes are where the model got it wrong. And in the first case, the model predicted this bottom list, the model predicted they die, but they actually live. And then the top right is where the model predicts they live and they actually die. Hopefully that's a little clearer. I'm not sure if I made it any clearer or maybe made it more confusing. So uh, one person uh, wants to know how you started first. You can start it from inside Anaconda. Jupyter Notebook comes with Anaconda and it will uh, start in your, whatever your, uh, I believe whatever your default browser is. So if you go into your Anaconda, you just type in, even at the top level of Anaconda, Jupyter Space Notebook. It would look just like this there. I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the chat. And if you need, and if you want more help like that, uh, no problem. So you do Jupyter Notebook. I noticed the weird spelling of Jupyter. I didn't just type it in the Y. Uh, you type that in in an anaconda prompt and it will uh, automatically come up in your browser. Um, and when I first learned Jupyter Notebook and I learned I was going to be coding in a browser, I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard of, like we were going backwards. But it's amazing. Okay. It is amazing. And it is a data scientist. It makes your life so much easier. So, um, and are there more questions in here? Zip file is perfect. You can also, yeah, Google Colab is the same. It's pretty much the same. So it'll run exactly in Google, Google Colab. Uh, it, Jonathan is right. It is called the confusion matrix. And it, it, I can't remember the why they call it a confusion matrix. It's not because it confuses people, but though it does. Um, uh, and we are sharing the code. Went through the four squares. Jupyter Notebook works well. I love Jupyter Notebook. Am I missing anything? Uh, 194 predicted, that's right. True positive, false positive, that's right. That, that's exactly right. And there's much more that goes into that box. I didn't show all of the details, something called uh, recall and precision are represented by those boxes. And again, uh, the problem with trying to make any general statement about those boxes is that every case is different. Um, again, when you're predicting medical cases or you're predicting fraud, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things we look at is if you have a thousand cases and you're checking for fraud and 99 and 999 or 995 of them do not have fraud and five do have fraud, Okay, you could pre just predict everyone does not have fraud and be right 99.5% of the time. However, your boss is going to think you're horrible at your job because you didn't catch the five cases you needed to catch, which was the fraud cases. So looking at accuracy, you have to look at that uh, confusion matrix. 
because looking at accuracy doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, and uh, the the graphic, the animation itself was done in Plotly, um, which is extremely powerful. Uh, it took me about 10 minutes to build that animation, to learn how to build that animation, um, and, the, and the slide chart. So um, that uses Plotly, uh, really cool, uh, really easy to set up. It was like I showed you about three lines. So. Somebody was asking about the Python libraries and modules used for the graphic animation and slider functionality. Yeah, that's what I was just mentioning. Oh, okay, so cool. it's done in here. I'll show. Uh, it looks like somebody did put the again. Anaconda link in there. Yeah, can you see? Uh, you see my screen again or no? No. no. Let's see. Where am I? I'm on screen one. There we go. Here I'll go up to the libraries, show you again. Now, as a rule, I generally like to have my live, all my libraries at the top of my code, but for this particular presentation. So these are the libraries I use, and, and I'm actually using Plotly Express, but if you just use import Plotly, this comes with it, uh, and you can just do pip space install space Plotly, and uh, it will install. Uh, and then I'm using the Express portion to do it, so that's the library I use to create this particular graph. Uh, this one here and this one here are done with Plotly. And this is the line. And then um, what you input to it actually, in this particular case, is a, a Python pandas data frame. And then you can mess with what parts of the data frame you want to display where. Okay. And the animation creates the, in this particular case, it is the uh, slider bar it says animation but it's the slider bar for it so um i love uh plotly is really cool it can do some cool interactive things um you, i believe plotly has a version in r i think plotly comes in r javascript and python so i believe you can um i haven't done r in quite a while so i don't want to say uh, either way um, what code would you like? Uh, and I'm not sure about getting the code in a, uh, I'm not sure about getting the code in email. That's if there's a link to whatever, um, you're sharing, then I can, I can put that in the email when I send it okay. out. Um, we can figure that out, whether we want to share a link or just a zip file. Yeah. What would you prefer? Um, whatever is easier. Um, yeah, just let me know which one you would prefer. Sorry, I am got some votes for link. links. They were asking yeah. for the link in the chat. Um, Anything that we can do? Didn't know it was in Julia. I uh, don't know Julia, but Plotly comes in, in quite a few flavors. I have a feeling I haven't used it in all of them. So, zip would contain all the data and, and code as well. The only problem is I'll have to look and see. The images get kind of big. I may take the images out if we zip it, uh, but it, the, the data file is real small. I mean, I can I can put the I can put the zip in the chat right now if anybody wants it, or at least I can attempt to. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, let me see. It's kind of big is the only thing. Well, we can see if that works or. Yeah, let me let me stop sharing so that I can. I feel like I've shared a Jupyter Notebook before for another. Oh, no, you could definitely share a Jupyter Notebook. Yeah. My only concern is that my my uh, that directory is kind of big. OK, so let me uh, let me see. Let's see how big this thing is. So. I think this is 31 megabytes. That can cause anybody some pain. So it is, where did it go? Here it is. It is uh, 31 megabytes. Is that going to be too big? We can give it a try. Uh, we can start that with that.
Give me just one second. Let's see, let's see what do I have to do. We'll see if this uh, puked. Sounds good. I'm into trial and error. Yeah, give it a try. So it's trying. So this is a seven, this is a zip file. Um, I use on Windows, you can use seven zip for free. Uh, it's a free little utility. It is an amazing utility for Windows. Uh, and it just calls just like this. If you download seven zip, uh, oh, I love seven zip too, Jonathan. It's amazing. It does all kinds of stuff. It'll do tar, zip, G G zip, um, roar files. Uh, it shakes, it bakes, it comes with steak knives. It's amazing. So that looks like it's going to upload. Like I said, 31 megs. I don't remember how much of that is actually <laughs> used. The data file is really small. Uh, a lot of that's all images, and I have a lot of extra images in there. So you now have extra images. And some extra notebooks. I've got extra notebooks and things in here I didn't necessarily get to clean up. Uh, actually, I just have the one. Cool. So I think the images directory is kind of big. I could probably re redo this with just the data if anybody wants. So can you guys see the zip file? Yeah, there it is. So that has everything I showed tonight and some. So, woohoo! How are we doing, Ms. Corey? We are good. Does anybody have any other questions? Thank you. Oh, I love to hear that. So we are going to have another session in October. We're going to do machine, more machine learning specific on baseball data. I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet. And Jonathan will actually be joining us um, for uh, as a panel. We'll be doing some projections, right, about the World Series. Is that what we're looking at? We're we're gonna. I hope. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I put the link in the chat for everybody. It's going to be on October 12th. So our data science yeah. uh, events are typically the third Wednesday, but our fabulous Joe is going to be out of town. So we went ahead and moved will it be. up. Woohoo, on a cruise. <laughs> so it, it's going to be October 12th. It'll be starting at 6 p.m. Eastern instead of 7 p.m. Eastern. And that link will take you to the registration page if anybody's interested in signing up for that. So there's a question about predicting winning lottery numbers, and it cannot do that uh, because machine learning can only predict systems that are predictable, and lottery numbers are not. Um, uh, you cannot predict uh, solar flares because they're too chaotic. Uh, so, um, and and that's a hard thing for people sometimes is that uh, the stock market has a tendency to be too chaotic. Um, the thing about machine learning is you have to be able to put in all the features that control the system. So like with the stock market, a lot of that, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on the stock market by any means, but a lot of that is based on whim of people and people freaking out and people having good feelings about things. And we don't have that data. So, uh, but you could try it. I mean, there's a lot of people trying it right now. You know, uh, you can use uh, random number generators, you know, uh, and we do that some, you know, as a way to get a feeling for how your model's working. So, ooh, we have workshop goals. I like it. Yeah, we, we have a YouTube channel and that's going to be where cool. all of our workshops go after we're done recording them. Cool. So if you're looking for any that's more. Really cool examples of their um, data science workshops, they would all be stored there in that link. Uh, I also dropped a link in the chat for just any, all the other upcoming events. If there's anything else that you guys are looking at, we host uh, software engineering, product design, cybersecurity, and data science events, uh, one per discipline per month. What are the most valuable use for data science predictions? Uh, it, yeah, in terms of what industry? That'd be my question. Um, like I'm working with weather data right now and my model does amazing training 
but the predictions are still too far off. Um, and I mean, if I could get the predictions to match the training, the energy companies would be extremely interested because I could predict the temperatures in Denver within about a degree uh, for the monthly mean temperature. So it would tell us when Denver's gonna be really cold and when it's gonna be really warm and when it's gonna be average. And the energy companies use that to uh, uh, correctly um, ship energy to certain sectors when they know they're gonna be really cold. So, see you later, Jonathan. I'll see you hopefully soon. So yeah, Ryan, did you have a particular industry? Uh, and one thing, you know, we teach at Flatiron is every industry has its own standard. Every industry has its way of doing things and every industry has particular data they like and they use. Um, you know, you'll learn natural language processing. We saw just a tiny bit of that earlier. Um, what we did today with the classification problem, a binary classification problem, which means you choose it between a zero and a one. And you can think of that like, uh, uh, like images of dogs would be a binary classification. Can you predict whether an image is a dog or not? So, uh, to give you an idea, those are some of the things we you learn here at Flatiron. Uh, some different machine learning techniques and ideas. And you also learn neural networks, which are my favorite. Corey, did you see is the meeting next, next month, 6 or 7 p.m.? I think. I'm just double checking real quick. Yeah. So I'm not saying the wrong thing since I have. A couple yeah. of it's coming up. I'm guessing oh, seven. I'm but... sorry. It is going to be at seven o'clock. We kept them at okay. the same time because um, you're in Denver. Yeah. So we'll, it'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern. Apologies. Okay. 7 PM, but 7 p.m. for me. Can you suggest some questions that should be prepared for data science interns? Uh, boy, that's a good one. It kind of depends what industry you're going to be interning in. But you know, like one, uh, you're going to be looking at classifications, you think, you're going to be looking at time series. Um, just trying to think off the top of my head, we have a department that works on this, actually. Uh, um, like, be prepared to, 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 so you're going to be doing this in Python? Or is it just more of a general? So, uh, be prepared to talk about SK Learn and Keras. What's the difference between those? Um, be prepared to discuss how you might approach a certain problem. They might ask you how you would approach a binary classification. They might ask you how you would approach a multi-class classification. Um, what's the difference between uh, uh, you know labeled and unlabeled data? Uh, um, well, there's one on the top of my tip of my tongue. I'm tired about it today and I can't remember it. But you know, some of those basic ideas, uh, how might you work with the time series, but that might be a little more complicated. Uh, working with time series is a little different. So if you're doing anomaly detection, then that is more time series related in general. Uh, you know, what model would you, what model would you use? Um, how, what anomalies from what, you know, uh, a baseline average, a seasonal average um, off of, you know, what kind of anomaly detection, I guess would be one thing. Um, you don't need machine learning for anomaly detection necessarily, uh, even though you could try to predict anomalies. And I, that's what I do with one of my weather models. Um, the question in the weather model, is it better to put in the time series as a whole or uh, actually just put in the anomalies and try to just predict them. Um, so what model might you use to do that? Uh, in anomaly detection, you might be using the long short-term memory model as part of a neural network. Uh, it's supposed to be kind of hyper-tuned or tuned for time series problems because uh, it's part of an RNN, uh, recurrent neural network, which uh, works better with time series data and the convoluted neural network. So what's the difference between those two? 
just some ideas off the top of my head. Well, thank you again to Joe and everybody else who zoomed in with us tonight. Uh, if you have any further questions about Flatiron School, um, I'm going to drop this little link in here. This is um, our fabulous admissions team. They can answer all of your questions um, about the program. Apologies, my fingers not as fast as they used cool. to be. <laughs> and then as a reminder, you're going to receive a copy of tonight's presentation within three business days of this event. So if you'd like to see anything else, I put that YouTube link in the chat earlier. And thank you and have a wonderful night. We hope to see you all again soon. Cool. Bye, y'all. Everybody, thanks for coming. <laughs>